Behind me right there is the uh, famous lymphoma research ride from a year or two past, which we've raised almost $7 million for the LRF. And uh, we're very, very happy to do that. Um, for those of you who are here, you're probably here because your initial treatment didn't do all it was supposed to do. Uh, have hope. We have lots of exciting things uh, in the future for you. Now, follicular lymphoma is an insulin disorder. And as you can see on this slide, which is an amalgam of almost 2,000 patients from France and the US, the 10 year survival is about 80%. And uh, so that, that's not too bad. Uh, however, the cause of death, the main cause of death remains follicular lymphoma. You can see on the blue curve, uh, in contrast to treatment related deaths, other malignancies, other causes, et cetera. So we still have a ways to go. An important observation was made oh, a number of years ago. Uh, there was the National Lympho Care Study, which collected data from community practices and academic centers. Patients treated with the regimen RCHOP, which we don't use much anymore, for follicular lymphoma. And what they showed was that there was an entity we now call POD24 or progression of disease at 24 months. The top curve, if you have not progressed within 24 months, your survival is consistent with an age match population who doesn't have lymphoma. It doesn't mean you may not need to be retreated at some point, but you've got a pretty good survival out there about 90% at eight, nine years. The other group, unfortunately, doesn't fare as well. And their outcome, is about half that, it's about 40% at eight or nine years. So that's really a population that's an unmet medical need. This is uh, not an old slide, but it's old data. And what we used to tell people is that with each successive line of treatment, the duration of response and the likelihood of response go down. But those data are with treatments that are now considered out of date. And we're doing much better than that now. But in the old days, there was first line, second, third, fourth. So by the time you got the fifth line, things look pretty dreary, but not so much anymore. Now, not everybody who progresses needs to be treated at the time of progression, just like not everybody needs to be treated at the time of presentation. Patients need to be treated if they experience disease-related symptoms, which are fevers, chills, unexplained weight loss, drenching night sweats, profound fatigue, rapidly growing or bulky lymphadenopathy, lymph node enlargement, Risk, what I call risky adenopathy. That means a lymph node that's near something important, like you've got a big lymph node near your carotid artery or near some other major vessel. A big spleen or bone marrow compromise resulting in anemia, low red cell count, or thrombocytopenia, a low platelet count, or neutropenia, a low white blood cell count. When it is time to treat, there are a number of tests that should be considered. Certainly rechecking the blood counts, the complete metabolic panel, which assesses kidney function, liver function, electrolytes, et cetera. The LDH, which is a blood test, which is sort of a tumor marker. Uric acid, which can be high if there's bulky disease. And if it's high, can result in some other metabolic abnormalities and kidney problems and stones and what have you. A PET CT scan should be performed. And in most cases, a tumor biopsy. 
not a needle aspiration. Those are kind of useless, but either a core biopsy, which is a bigger needle, or an excisional biopsy, which means you take out part or all of the lymph node. This gives you a better idea of what is going on in the lymph node than simple the cells that you would aspirate through a needle. One of the reasons we want to repeat a biopsy is to make sure that the patient hasn't experienced what is called histologic transformation. Histologic transformation is when the follicular lymphoma, the indolent low-grade disease, transforms into an aggressive, high-grade, more problematic lymphoma. And this occurs at a frequency of, oh, one and a half to two or three percent a year. And we suspect it if there is a change in the clinical status, such as a decline in the performance status, which means how the patient functions, their strength, their ability to do their normal daily activities, unexplained weight loss, new B symptoms, which are the ones I mentioned before, the fevers, chills, et cetera, rapid growth of disease. This suspicion may be supported by an elevated LDH, elevated serum calcium, and a markedly increased standardized uptake value or brightness on the PET CT scan. Now, histologic transformation is an important issue. This was a large study done in France and followed patients it was called the PRIMA study, which looked at the role of maintenance therapy, which didn't show any benefit from maintenance therapy, be that as it may. Um, of the patients who clinically progressed, they documented progression by biopsy in 42%. Of those, almost a quarter had histologic transformation. What's really critical is almost 60% of the histologic transformations occurred in the first year and were heralded by a decrease in performance status, elevated LDH, B symptoms, anemia, uh, and at presentation had a high follicular lymphoma international prognostic index. Uh, it wasn't associated with response to induction or the use of maintenance therapy. In this study, of the patients who progressed, those who had persistent follicular lymphoma had a survival about 80% at six years in the blue curve on top. But those who had histologic transformation were down around 40%. So quite a difference. And some of this can be attributed to the initial therapy. For example, if a patient was initially treated with the RCHOP regimen and then transformed, their outcome was, look at the left-hand panel, was the gold curve. If they didn't have RCHOP prior to transformation, it was the blue curve meaning that what we usually use to treat patients who transform is our chop. So if you've already had it, you can't get it again and your outcome is poor. On the right, we see that patients who didn't have our chop initially and then got it a transformation, their outcome was the same as a patient with large cell lymphoma, which is much better than uh, the group who had previously gotten our chop. Now, there is a really other kind of bad, bad, bad kind of transformation, which occurs primarily at this time of the year and occurs in the setting of a full moon and is shown on this slide. So at this time of the year, one must be careful of this transformation. There are a number of approved treatment options 
for relapsed and refractory follicular lymphoma. You can get uh, monoclonal antibodies such as rituximab, or rituxan, or obinutuzumab, again, but they have limited efficacy a second time. There was radioactive monoclonal antibody called ibrutumumab tioxetan or zevalin, but no one really uses this anymore. Uh, there was very restricted eligibility criteria. It had a risk of secondary leukemias. A bendamustine, which a lot of people get frontline, or bendamustine uh, obinutuzumab, uh, has, isn't used much because most patients get bendamustine rituximab up front. R squared, uh, which is a regimen that I'll talk about in a bit, uh, is sometimes used up front, but is a very good regimen for this setting. And I'll show you this information in a bit. Tazimetastat is another drug. Uh, there was a whole class of drugs called the PI3 kinase inhibitors. Most of these have been, uh, shall we say, trashed by the FDA and are no longer available. Capamlisib was intravenous, uh, three weeks out of four indefinitely. So the schedule was somewhat um, inconvenient. Uh, this may be available. But umbralisib and duvalisib and idelalisib are were too toxic, uh, despite the fact that they were effective agents and have been removed from the market. There's CAR T cell therapy that I'll talk about, which has a very high cost and limited availability, and for very rare patients, an allogeneic bone marrow transplant, which I haven't used in a patient with follicular lymphoma. Uh, I can't even remember one. Now, as far as bendamustine goes, uh, we conducted what was called the Gadolin trial, which was in patients refractory to rituximab. They were randomized to bendamustine obinutuzumab, which is the GB, or bendamustine alone. And this group also got obinutuzumab maintenance. Uh, we showed that response rates were very high in both of the arms, uh, 80 plus percent. But the group that got the bendamustine obinutuzumab had a longer time to progression, significantly longer and a longer overall survival. The problem is that virtually none of these patients had prior bendamustine. So it's not relevant to the uh, routine patient. Now, lenalidomide is an important drug. It is an immunomodulatory agent, a derivative of thalidomide. And it has a number of important immunological effects. It affects T cells, it affects B cells, natural killer cells, and has major effects on the microenvironment in which the lymphoma lives. Back in about 04, uh, when I chaired the CALGB Lymphoma Committee, we developed a series of biological doublets trying to get rid of chemotherapy. And one of the ones we developed was the regimen called R squared, which is rituximab and revlimid, or rituximab and lenalidomide. And this is a study that was chaired by John Leonard in our group. And it showed that the combination of rituximab and lenalidomide was superior to lenalidomide alone, both regards to time to progression on the left and survival on the right. And then came the AUGMENT study, which was R-squared versus rituximab and placebo in follicular and marginal zone lymphoma. And here we showed that R-squared was better than R, which gives support that R alone is not a very good therapy. And it also had a superior progression-free survival in the top and overall survival on the bottom. This led to its approval by the FDA for second line follicular lymphoma and is a very effective and a standard regimen now. Now, tazimetastat is a relatively new drug. 
It targets what's called EZH2. I won't spell it out all that for you. It's really a long name, which uh, is involved in epigenetics, modulation of genes. Now, EZH2 plays a critical role in multiple forms of cancer. And when the gene is mutated, it can act as uh, an oncogenic driver promoting cancer. Tazimetastat is the first drug that renders this uh, EZH2 inactive. And in the paper that was published of a clinical trial, they divided patients into two groups. Those that had mutated genes, which should do worse, but respond better. And those what's called wild type or unmutated. And these two groups, unfortunately, were not similar. The group that had, did not have the mutation, had more prior therapies and had more poor risk features. That outline in the red here. They had three, median prior of three versus median prior of two and lots of other adverse features, but it looked like the mutation mattered. So when the FDA approved this drug, you had to have a mutation. Well, when I looked at this paper, it just looked funny to me because the two groups were imbalanced. So we did an analysis. And if you match patient to patient, you find out that the response rates aren't as different but mostly, most importantly, that the time to progression is the same. So it doesn't matter if you have the mutation. The drug is active in about 50, 60% of patients. It is a pill and it has minimal toxicity and is approved by the FDA for third line. Now, brutinib, you must, most of you probably heard about it. Brutinib, it's a great drug for CLL and Waldenstrom's response rates over 90%. Uh, mantle cell lymphoma about 80%, marginal down to 50, but follicular lymphoma, we published this study and it was a dud. And that was very disappointing. We didn't understand that. But more recently, a study was done with a next generation BTK inhibitor called Zanubrutinib. And this was a randomized study uh, Zanu plus obinutuzumab, the anti-CD20 antibody, versus obinutuzumab, and the overall response rate of 68 versus 46, the complete response rate of 37 versus 19, really favored the combination. Now, is that because it's a combination or because zanubrutinib is more effective in follicular lymphoma? We can't tell from this study. But the median duration of response uh, at 18 months, 71% of patients had not progressed and versus 55 with obinutuzumab. Uh, the median time to progression was over two years versus less than one year. So the combination was really more effective. And hopefully this will get approved and be another available option. Now, these are the drugs I was mentioning before. I call them the ISIB sisters. The PI3 kinase inhibitors. The first one was idelalisib, which uh, was pretty toxic and no one really liked it. Uh, Capanlisib was challenging to give. Duvalisib was also very toxic. Umbralisib seemed to be pretty good. It seemed to be the least toxic of the bunch, but it was given indefinitely with a CD20 antibody and that induced a high incidence of COVID many cases of which were fatal. The only one still being studied is Zandalisib. And this is in clinical trials and it's given differently, unlike the others which were continuous. Here you get two cycles and then you get intermittent dosing. Hopefully that will reduce the toxicity. And in this study, the overall response rate in follicular lymphomas was 70%, half of which were complete remissions. The toxicities were relatively mild. There was some diarrhea, some lowering of the white blood count, but mostly low grade. Now, the study they're trying to do to get it approved by the FDA is Zandalisib rituximab, 
versus bendamustine or taximab. And I'm not sure this study will ever get done, particularly in this country, um, because no one is using rituximab, bendamustine in the relapse setting anymore. But we'll see. Now we get to the exciting stuff. Um, by specific antibodies. These are really hot. And there are a couple of structures. Uh, this one drug, mosinituzumab, um, has over here a portion that binds to CD20 on B cells, and here binds to CD3 on T cells. This other one, glofitimab, has a little different structure. It's called a two to one, because this is twice as long, but basically does the same thing. So how does this work? Well, the portion that binds CD3 attaches to the T cells. The portion that binds CD20 binds to the B cells, brings them close together, resulting in a synapse between the two of them, kind of a bond. And this releases a number, let's go back, a number of enzymes which kill the lymphoma cell. There are more than five of these out there now in clinical trials. Mosinituzumab, glufitimab, odronextimab, epcaritimab, and the last one we don't talk about much, but there are others as well. Now, glufitimab, is given IV, as is otronextamab, intravenous, whereas mosinituzumab and epcaritimab have subcutaneous, meaning under the skin preparations. Glufitimab is given for 12 cycles, mosinituzumab for eight, otronextamab indefinitely until progression, the same thing with epcaritimab. These have class-specific toxicities, and I've just listed four of them. The ones that we worry about are a cytokine release syndrome, or CRS, which is fevers, lowering of the blood pressure, and low oxygen or hypoxia. Then they have ICANS, immune effector cell-associated neurotoxicity syndrome with abnormalities in consciousness, seizures, motor findings, and evidence of intracranial pressure increase. There's tumor lysis syndrome, and you can get a lowering of the blood counts. But they are very effective. Epcaritimab, um, small number of follicular patients, but the response rate's 90%, half of which are complete remissions. It takes less than two months to get a response. And some of these responses are out well beyond a year. Although you do get the cytokine release and all these other things, the likelihood that these are severe, meaning grade three or worse, is virtually nil. Glofitimab on the right, I boxed off the follicular. Uh, the response rate is 62%, 50% complete remissions. It even had activity in transformed lymphoma. All three of them responded. The time to response was very quick, around two months. The duration of response, it shows that some responses are out there a couple of years. The... Um, Duration of complete remission is about 80% of them out there a couple of years. And the progression-free survival here is a median of about a year. Toxicities are what I mentioned before. These are the ones related to the drug, cytokine release, neutropenia. These are mostly grade one and two, which is low to moderate severity. Mosinituzumab, we call it mosin. And here's a study of 90 patients. Um, and the overall response rate was 80%, 60% complete remissions. And the cytokine release syndrome and neurotoxicity of severe, of severe grade were infrequent and hospitalization was not required. 
And the progression-free survival on average was 18 months. And for the complete remissions, it, the median has not yet been reached, but it doesn't look like these curves are flat. It doesn't look like this is curative therapy. And the last one I'll mention is odronextamab, which in follicular lymphoma had a response rate of 91%, CR is in 72%. And the progression-free survival for folliculars is on top here. Uh, and it's out here, a uh, median of around a year and a half. Toxicities, again, grade three and worse, are very uncommon, except for infections. About a quarter of the patients had some infection. But other than that, not much. So just to review, glufitumab, response rate about 70%, half CRs, mosinituzumab, 80-60, odronextamab, 91. You can't say these are any different because the number of patients is small and the patients are, are different, but they all are very effective. And these drugs are also being combined with other biological therapies to make them more effective. And now CAR T cell. You're all probably familiar with it now, after all these years. You uh, take out blood from the patient, you separate out T cells, you uh, grow them in the lab, you transfect them with a virus, which makes them target specifically the CD19 on the B cells. You give the patient a little bit of chemotherapy to deplete lymphocytes and you reinfuse the modified T cells. This has been explored in follicular lymphoma, uh, less so than in large cell lymphoma, but it is also approved for follicular lymphoma by the FDA. Based on the Zuma 7 trial, where the overall response rate was 92% and the complete remission rate was 76%. In follicular lymphoma, the overall response rate was 94% and 80% complete remissions. Median time to response was one month. And some patients with follicular who initially had a partial response subsequently converted to a complete response after about two months. Now, these data were recently supported by this analysis. There was a Zuma 5 trial with a product called AxiCell another study with follicular lymphoma, and they compared their data with what was called Scholar 5, which was a large database of follicular lymphoma patients from clinical trials and from other sources. So it's sort of an historical database who were treated with standard of care. And those data were compared with the AXI cell data. And here you can see progression-free survival for Zuma 5 patients was much longer than with the Scholar 5 patients. The overall survival was significantly longer. And the time to next treatment was significantly longer. So at least with this historical control, it seems better than we would get with standard of care. So pretty soon we're gonna have bispecific antibodies on the market. And we already have CAR T cell on the market. How do they stack up? Well, bispecifics will be off the shelf. Your local oncologist, uh, if he has the appropriate support people, will be able to give it in the clinic. We give it in our clinic. I have several patients 
for example, on epcaritumab now, and we're about to open a study with mosinituzumab. CAR-T, on the other hand, involves prolonged insurance approval, which can take months. There are some production issues, which means it's not always available if you need it. And it can take up to a couple of months to get the product. Bispecifics don't require pretreatment, although uh, some of them are given with a shot of an anti-CD20 antibody first. That's pretty easy compared to the lymphodepleting chemotherapy with CAR-T. But the overall response rate looks a little bit lower with biospecifics. The complete response rate looks a little bit lower. The duration of treatment can be a year or indefinite, whereas CAR-T is once. The duration of a complete remission is relatively similar. Hospitalization is not required for biospecifics, but it's usually required for CAR-T. The likelihood of grade three or worse cytokine release syndrome is similar. You don't get the kind of neurotoxicity with biospecifics that you do with CAR-T, and you don't get as much in the way of lowering blood counts with biospecifics. But both of these technologies are relatively early in their development. We're still adding other agents, combining various biological and immunological therapies to improve on their activity. And there are lots of clinical trials ongoing right now with those combinations. There are a number of other new drugs in development. Tafacitumab is an anti-typo here, CD19 monoclonal antibody. And this is approved for large cell lymphoma. And we have a clinical trial at our center looking at this in follicular and other low-grade lymphomas. Longcastuximab tesserine is an antibody drug conjugate also targeting CD19. This means it's an antibody that binds to a toxin. The antibody brings the toxin directly to the lymphoma cell where it is internalized and kills the lymphoma cell. And then we have uh, the anti-CD47 checkpoint inhibitors, the so-called don't eat me uh, proteins uh, that facilitate the ingestion of the lymphoma cells by the body's macrophages. So to leave adequate time for questions, I'll conclude. Follicular lymphoma in some patients is curable, but most patients will require more than one line of therapy. Upon relapse, transformation must be considered because it is managed differently than other patients with relapsed and refractory disease particularly if the progression occurs early, transformation should be suspected. Chemotherapy should no longer be considered an option for relapsed refractory follicular lymphoma because we have a number of biological and immunological treatments that are highly effective and are better tolerated. A single antibody like rituximab or obinutuzumab should rarely be used because we have a number of studies showing that that kind of approach is inferior to other forms of immunological and biological treatments. And now targeted agents are the standard of care, R-squared, tazimetastat, for example, and more coming down the pike. Immune and cellular therapies offer exciting options. I mentioned that CAR-T is already FDA approved, and I expect bispecifics to be approved soon. In fact, there was a bispecific just approved the other day for multiple myeloma, and hopefully a couple will be approved in lymphoma in the very near future. So when you're thinking of what to get for relapsed disease, consider a clinical trial, 
because it gets you access to these novel therapies even before they get to market. And new approaches will clearly improve outcome 